ಸಹನಾವತು ಸಹನೌ ಭುನಕ್ತು ಸಹ ವೀರ್ಯ ಕರವಾವಹೈ ತೇಜಸ್ವಿನಾವಧೀತಮಸ್ತು ಮಾವಿದ್ವಿಷಾವಹೈ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಓಂ ಮೇ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮನ್ ಪ್ರೊಟೆಕ್ಟ್ ಅಸ್ ಬೋಥ್ ದಟ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ಟೀಚರ್ ಅಂಡ್ ದ ಟಾಟ್ ಮೇ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮನ್ ನರೀಶ್ ಅಸ್ ಬೋಥ್ by bestowing the fruit of knowledge may we both obtain the energy to acquire knowledge may what we both study reveal the truth may we cherish no ill feeling towards each other om peace 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 om namo bhagavate vaivasvataye vrityave brahma vidya acharyaya nachiketa secha om salutations to the god of death the blessed one the son of vivaswat the teacher of brahma vidya that is the science of god and as also to nachiketa in our last study we saw yama telling us about the unifying advaitic vision that there is no multiplicity whatsoever and that one who sees the many goes from death to death he also said that freedom from fear and misery and fearlessness is the fruit of the realization of advaitic unity in this chapter also he almost speaks in the same strain there's quite a bit of repetition in this chapter 2 repetition is a fault in a general way in all the literature so seeing this repetition again and again shri shankaracharya says namantranam jamita asti repetition is not a fault with respect to mantras that is the spiritual statements since the theme is very difficult to comprehend and beyond the pale of ordinary experience so re- repetition becomes a necessary to the question as to where shall we seek brahman the reply the answer of vedanta is here within the man itself this comes from the definition of brahman what vedanta gives according to vedanta what is brahman brahman is that from which the universe of entities and beings arise that in which it rests and that into which it returns at the end the universe includes man and in the search of truth and the meaning of existence vedanta found finds that man is a significant item in all the nature hence it studies him in depth so yama is starting this first mantra particularly in connection with the body the first mantra puram ekadash yes the first mantra says the city of the unborn the puram ekadash dwaram this i just made very good so puram ekadash dwaram adasya avakra chetasah anushthayana shochati vimuktascha vimuchyate etat vaitat this refrain will be repeated again and again in most of the mantras the city of the unborn atman or the soul of undimmed intelligence is of 11 gates having meditated upon him and realizing him one grieves no more 
liberated from all bonds of ignorance, one becomes free from relativity and finitude. This is verily that. Unborn. Unborn Atman. This is immortal Brahman. So this city, this body belongs to the Atman. And it has 11 gates. 11 gates are the 11 apertures. Seven on the top, two at the lower part. And according to Katha two more are there. In Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna says only nine. Navadwara Pure Dehi, he says. But here, Yama adds two more. That's one at navel and one at the top of the head. These are the 11 exit. Of course, the one on the top of the head is called as Brahmarandra. That is VIP exit, not for us. Only those who are yogis, they know how to get, not that the top of the head just cracks or anything. There's a very subtle way of passing away through that exit. So that's the city of unborn. And what sort of a uh, Atman is he? Avakrachaita saha. Uh, means undimmed. That is, look, from the standpoint of sun, there is no change in its brilliance. Day and night is for us, not from the point of sun. Likewise, from the standpoint of Atman, there is no change in the consciousness of the Atman. It is one uninterrupted flow of awareness is there as regards to the Atman. That's fine. As far as Atman is concerned, okay, what about me and you? We do not have that. So what the mantra actually tries to convey is the city and the dweller of the city, the owner of the city are not the same thing. The city has dwellers, dwelling places, everything, but it is owned by someone. So anything happening to the city doesn't affect directly the person. This is a simple truth. What is there so much in this we can say, but when it comes to our own psychophysical organism, we very badly fail to understand that this body is a dwelling place and we are the dwellers. This sharp distinction between the two, the dweller and the dwelling place, this sharp discernment comes to the person who constantly meditates uh, on the Atman. So what's the uh, message of this um, verse? So we need to attain to this avakrachetasa, this undimmed. Vakra means distorted. Avakra means undistorted. Undistorted intelligence. This is what we need to acquire as sadhakas. This is our immediate purpose. This cerebral system is given for us to make best use of and attain to this undimmed, undistorted understanding. And how do we do that? The Mundaka Upanishad says, through truthfulness, satyena tapasa samyajnyanena brahmacharya. That means the four things, satya, truthfulness, truthful thought, word, deed. There should be an alignment, it should be. No, uh, what do you call, pretense. What I think, I speak, what I speak, I do. There should be harmony in thought, word, deed. That's called as truthfulness. Then tapasa, concentration, constant meditation, and correct, reasoned conviction. Conviction based on 
clear reasoning that is called samya jnana and self control becomes as a matter of fact it comes as a matter of course things will come up we get the strength to practice celibacy it properly means brahmacharya means celibacy that is what constantly constantly when we practice this thing when this spiritual practices are done then we reach a state where our minds become clear will be freed from delusion and sorrow here and now if delusion and miseries are removed what else we need that is almost like a freedom that is the state of jeevan mukti being freed from the vagaries of the mind that is freedom while living and then once this we drop away the body we become completely free no more birth this is the idea of the the teaching of this verse supposing the next verse not the you don't have to put it i'll tell you this i'm generally but i'm not going to the sanskrit verses of all the uh, chapters i'll just go as a summary i will speak now once we we analyze the truth of our body and come to the conclusion that there is something more apart from this body mind complex that is the pure awareness is this awareness only in our body or our are the human body and nowhere else the upanishad says no the atman manifests itself in so many bodies this is how the upanishad comes to the unity through diversity he is in sun dwelling in the bright heavens he is the air in the inner space he is the fire and the altar he is the guest at home the hinduism teaches it's one of the tenets of hinduism that when a guest comes he is to be looked upon as veritable god atithi devo bhava he says so he is the atman is in the guest in the man in gods in truth truth the sure results of all your good undertakings noble undertakings so he is in the water as aquatic creatures he is on earth as cereals on the mountain as streams and he is unchanging truth and great brihad so before going the chart can you put the chart before going into the further uh, verses there is a little bit a small chart i am trying to present you because these are the things which we are going to discuss at the outset the pure consciousness is there when the pure consciousness get conditioned by the individual ignorance it appears as buddhi the intellect so the individuality comes the jivatva the individuality comes and in order to ascertain the brahman behind all this the vedanta gives three ways of coming to the reality that is one through ascertaining the three bodies or the five sheets or the three states so atman is beyond three bodies hmm? or beyond the five sheet panchakosha vilakshana and or beyond the three states so these are the things we will just analyze this gross body which we get from our parents and which is nourished by food so from the point of sheets it belongs to the food sheet annamaya kosha what we say in sanskrit this is food sheet and this is the food sheet this is the gross body which we deal with in the waking state and then the second of the three bodies is the subtle body and the subtle body is an aggregate a combination of many things that is the five pranas prana is the vital force 
it is actually one, but according to its function, it is divided into five, depending upon the function it does. The same Atman, the same, same prana is um, designated as in a different way. So, because we will be dealing with this, that's why I'm saying this. This five pranas and the five indriyas, that is the sense organs and five sense organs means perception and the action, 10 plus the prana five, then mind and intellect, and the whole lot. That is nearly 17 components are there in it. It's an aggregate. So this is the subtle body, which goes from one embodiment to the other. This whole baggage, this whole luggage will be taken. When we shift the house, we take all the luggages and go like that, big, big luggage. And that, that is these three sheets the vital sheet, the mental sheet, and the intellectual. Together is a subtle body. And this is very active in the dream state. It's there even in the waking state, too, but we become very much, it becomes very obvious in the dream state. And then there's the causal body. Causal body is nothing but ignorance. It is a source. It is the one which gives the idea that I'm an individual. It is because of the ignorance. Ignorance is the main basis for our embodiment. So it is called as causal body. But you might wonder, how can ignorance be blissful? This is bliss, blissful sheet because this is quite near to the Brahman. The bliss of the Brahman, just it's very, since it's very close, it in, inherits that bliss. That is why it is called a bliss sheet. And that we can feel it only in the deep sleep. That is dreamless sleep. These are the three states, three bodies, the five sheets and three bodies. And as and when we I deal with this, you can just go to it and find uh, and, and try to understand. Here, this Atman is independent of the body. The one which is dwelling within is independent of body. It is the Atman which animates. This city of human body has the presence of the Atman. Hmm? Nature has given certain clues. Intimation of immortality is this within this body. So what's one in intimation or one clue is this body itself, how it functions stationed itself in the center of the body, this Atman pushes the prana above and, and another manifestation of prana below. So this prana is the psychic energy, or the psychic force. Its obvious manifestation is in the breath, in the nostril, in the breath. That's a prana. And when the apana is one which pushes the waste food, undigested food and fluids. That is apana. And there is another manifestation of prana as called as vyana. The whole body is, it functions every, as nervous centers. It functions throughout the body. And then there is udana. It's at the throat. This helps to, for the soul and the subtle body to get out at the time of death. That's the function of Udana. And Samana digests our food. These are the five aspects of Prana according to the function. So this Atman seated here in the center does all makes the Prana to function in this way. And all the sense organs pay homage to the Atman. How? Like a king seated in the court with all the ministers and the subjects bring various offering. Like that, the senses bring all the impressions and experiences of the external world to this king called the Atman. The whole of nature is for the education of the Atman which is in, inside the body. This experiences enables it to understand 
the limitation of sense enjoyments, thereby learn its lessons, disentangle itself from it, and be established in its true nature, which is self effulgence, immutable, eternal, infinite. So, this is the purpose of nature outside. The nature is not for the enjoyment of the Atman or us. The nature is for the education of the Atman. That is a big thing to understand. So when a person or a soul identifies completely with the body and dwelling in it, when it's torn away from the body at the time of death, it takes the, all the whole, as I told you, the whole luggage goes. A doubt may arise in us that won't this life force, the prana, answer to all the queries? What is the necessity for us to posit a Atman, something behind an un unchanging reality? Isn't this enough? Can't it answer? Because we see when a person is dying, we say the last breath, he took his last breath just a few minutes ago, he breathed his last. So breath, taking the last breath is so obvious we can see. And we know the body is lying there, inert. So isn't this enough? Why should we post that there is a, something unchangeable? This question naturally arises for every one of us in our early stages of reasoning because our reasoning hasn't been sharp enough, it needs more investigation. So to answer this, this for this question, because this doubt arises in everyone. So Emma answers it. He says, very emphatically, he says, neither by the prana or apana does anyone live. One lives on something else, which is on which these are dependent. You know, there's a story in the Upanishads. The, in the sense organs once had a uh, conference and they wanted to prove the greatness of themselves. So the I said, I am the great, I am biggest one because you, I, I see, if I don't see, nothing happens. Each one claimed themselves great. But okay, we will put it into test. So the eyes went away. But the other sense organs are working well, no problem. Then I felt very bad, you know. It quietly came and it didn't speak much. It came back into the body. Then the ears thought, I am great. So ear went. If one organ goes, the other, other organs become strong and thereby the life goes on, isn't it? So this way everything happened. And finally, they couldn't make out what's the problem. So who, who, who is great among us? So they went to the chief prana. That's called as the mukhya prana, the chief prana. So you see, we have a problem. Who is greater among that? Oh, is that so? Okay, then let me get up and go. So saying, the prana got up. Immediately, all the organs, oh, no, 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 no. They also got up. So that means if the prana is not there, all these organs can't work. Life energy is taken. So that's the story. But then even this prana is under the control of the Atman because these are all aggregates. An aggregate cannot be an independent agent. They work, they serve an conscious entity who is the master of it. So that is why am I saying no one lives either by the prana or apana or whatever, however great it might be, on something on which these two, and that is the Atman. There is a very beautiful incident in the life of Swami Shivananda. Once he was old at that time in the bewilderment. One night he couldn't sleep. He was he, asthmatic and he had an uh, attack of asthma. He couldn't sleep the whole night and he could see the life force wants to get out and something is resisting. There was a tug of war, he says. There was a tug of war between the two forces. And then 
suddenly he saw Sri Ramakrishna. He, Sri Ramakrishna said, why are you going? There's a lot more to be done. This is not the time for you to go. And then the yes, higher force came down and everything settled. Then the morning when the monks came, he was telling his experience. And then one of the Swami asked, Maharaj, what is it? What is that? He says, there was a two tug of war between two forces. One was trying to go, the other one was going, trying to pull. So what is it? He says, that's the Atman. It's, it's so obvious. Even the life force is controlled by the Atman. Life force is great in itself. It's, but it is an aggregate. So it doesn't have independence of its own. It's dependent on a conscious entity called the Atman. And after this, Emma says, we, we remember the wonderful question of Nachiketa. What happens when a person dies? Is there anything left? Does anything succeed the body? So this so the question he had put in the, in the first chapter of the Upanishad. Now, Yama is trying to answer them. This first verse which we read, where it said that the person who meditates on the Atman, realizes its nature, gets liberated. Fine, that's no problem. But what about the persons who have not realized are very ordinary person absolutely has no idea of what the self is. What about them? For them, Vedanta says, doctrine of karma and rebirth are laid down for it. And here is a very bitter truth, which is not palatable to everybody. But that's a fact. Yama says, when such a person gets out of the body, he enters the womb of an embodied being or may enter a plant, trees, like that. Or even worse than that, in the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, you can see the disciples of Sri Ramakrishna making fun of Dr. Mahendra Sarkar because he was such an atheist, wouldn't believe anything. And say, they would say, so you're, from the next time, you're going to start with brick and stone. This, such an atheist can't believe anything. So it is better to be like an inert object. So, so this is also possible. So this is, this idea is a very hard truth to accept. Naturally, we'll say a person who has risen to such a scale of a human being in the evolution how can that person be born again as a plant or an animal? You know, you, you feel repulsive to ac accept this idea. But the Vedanta doesn't mean to say that all intellectuals, all rational beings have to be born again. Is it? No, it only states that if a person, if the effect of a person's action or his state of awareness is such that he needs the body of lower organism to experience, he will have it. There is, there is no, nothing to stall it. The thing is, the nature has given us this big gift of cerebral system. And it has greater functions. Supposing a person doesn't make use of it, animals don't need that. As far as animals are concerned, ahar nidhira maithu, food, sleep, and survival, regeneration. That's it, nothing more. If we confine, if a human being confines his life within this, what's the difference between him and an ordinary animal? So nature says, well, I gave you this instrument, you didn't use it. I can go back. So this is the danger. So when we have got as human beings this capacity to reason, we need to make use of it completely so that we do not fall below in the scale of evolution. Sri Krishna tells 
in Bhagavad Gita, Gahana Karmano Gatihi, very intricate is the way karma works. So if our karma needs it, it will go. But we should remember, as I told you in the chart, it's the causal body that goes from one body to other, the causal body, the subtle body, sorry, not the causal body, the subtle body, it takes the big luggage and goes. But the Atman is not affected by it. The Atman is never affected by any of the thing. It is the ever blissful conscious entity. Because its consciousness, it's, it's very own. Not that it is the conscious, it is consciousness itself. So that consciousness will never get disturbed or affected by anything. It these things affect the karma affects only the cause I mean, subtle body. It's a subtle body which goes. And it doesn't, as I told you, it doesn't affect the Atman. Swamiji in his sannyasin, song of sannyasin, he says, who sows must reap, they say, and the cause must bring the sure effect. Good, good, bad, bad. But uh, good, good, and none escape the law. Whoso wears a form must wear the chain. See, whoso wears a form must wear the chain. That is the chain of cause and effect. Too true, but far beyond name and form is Atman, ever free. No, the word that sannyasin bol, say om tat sat om. This chain of cause and effect can be eroded gently and steadily by spiritual culture, by spiritual education. And finally, it can be completely destroyed through the realization of the Atman. So that is a big hope. <clears throat> and there's another clue which the psychophysical organism is giving us to understand our immortal nature. The Upanishad's approach to the highest reality is through the investigation of the three states of mind, which is which nature has given to us. That is the waking, the chart has the waking, dream, and dreamless state. In the waking state, it's very hard to understand the Atman or to separate the Atman from the not self. It's, it's so muddled up, it's very difficult to separate them. But at certain rare moments of introspection and calmness, it can be understood to some extent. But in dream, it makes itself felt more and in the dreamless state. What actually happens in the dream is the self, it is the self which is the creator, creator and the perceiver of both. We go in our dream to London by plane. We manufacture the plane in the dream. We are the passengers, we are the plane and we are going, space and time has come so close. In one night we go and come and we are the perceiver. How? Next morning you say, you know yesterday in dream I had been to London. Who, who knew? How did you know that? That shows that the Atman is also the perceiver of both. Subject and object are both the self and the perceiver too. And of course, there is another state which is called as deep sleep, dreamless sleep, where the Atman does not project any object of perception. It just remains as a witness. So when we take into consideration, take all the facts of these three states and philosophically investigate, then the truth of our self gets revealed. So this is another approach of coming to the truth of the Atman with the help of our own body and mind. Because in our last chapter, Yama had said, Manasai Veda Maptavyam. 
It has to be understood through the mind. What sort of mind? Pure mind, which has got the capacity to reason, to go penetrate. But this is how we develop the sharpness of the intellect. And the ninth mantra. Ninth. Agni Rithai Kobhonam. So in spite of the multiplicity of the Atman bodies, the Atman is one and nine, non-dual. That has been said. Agni Rithai Kobhonam Pravishto Rupam Rupam Prati Rupo Bhava Ekastatha Sarva Bhutan Taratma Rupam Rupam Prati Rupo Bhishcha. As one fire having entered the world assumes various forms according to the different objects through which it manifests. So the one inner self of all being appears in various forms according to the different objects through which it manifests. And it exists also outside these forms in its transcendent aspect. So multiplicity of the body, just as fire, he gives an example of fire. So we have got so many manifestations of fire. The first and the greatest is the solar energy. Then comes nuclear energy. Then the ordinary coal, fuel, electricity, whatnot. And again, the thing in which it is contained, maybe a mercury bulb or a sodium bulb, something soothing, something very strong. So brighter, so various manifestation of energy and light. But the one thing is, it's just one principle of fire, manifesting itself in so many ways. In the same way, the Atman manifests itself in the angels, in human beings, in plants, animals, water, in so many ways it manifests itself. And it is not exhausted just by the manifestation of it. Sri Krishna says in the Gita, just a particle of myself, I support through just a particle of myself, this whole universe. In the Purusha Shukta, we say, only a quarter of the Purusha is this manifested universe. And three-fourths of this is transcendental. So infinity cannot be exhausted just by the manifestation of this cosmos or anything. If it is infinite, what is after all this manifestation? It's, it's a speck in it. And 11th, we might think that since the Supreme Self is the self of all things, does it get colored by the taint of what it, about the container, the one it, it contains itself. So that is being refuted. Suryo yatha sarva lokasya chakshu nalipyate chakrushay bahya doshaihi ekas tatha sarva bhutantaratma nalipyate loka dukkhena bahya. Just as the sun, the eye of the whole world is never sullied by the external faults of the eyes of creatures. So the one inner self of all beings is never sullied by the miseries of the world as it, that is in its own form is also transcendent. The sun illumines everything. Good and bad, everything is revealed by the light of the sun. It's through the light of the sun we see. That is why it's called Lokasya Chakshu is the eye of the world, the sun, because through it, we see everything. But that doesn't pollute the sun. Yes, our eyes, our mind may be polluted. Supposing, supposing I see something not good, something impure, it makes a reaction on my mind. But that, that is why he's asking, does it make on the Atman? No, just less. The dirt of the universe doesn't sully the sun. In the same way, it doesn't sully the Atman. My mind might get polluted, 
but not the Atman. This sharp distinction between the mind and the Atman, this is what the Upanishad is trying to make us understand. You are not this, you are that. You are not this, you are that. So slowly these ideas are sinking. Yama is repeating the same thing. Because it's a hard subject from different standpoint, view of standpoint. He's, he's trying to make us understand this one. That the message of the Upanishad is only this. That you are divine. You are something different from all. You are not what you seem to think. You are something different. And you will never be affected by any of this. The Atman is never affected by the saintliness of the saint or the wickedness of the wicked. Because it is ever the illumining. It just illumines. It is not affected by that. But, so do you think I can do anything? No, saintliness is my necessity. It's the education that I'm giving to my mind, not to the Atman. If I am pure, only then I will gain. He said in the open is the same kind of initiative we read. This cannot be, this Atman cannot be attained by the wicked. You have to go get rid of all the evil ways. Because it's for my education. But by Atman by itself is not affected. We should remember this. We are that Atman. We are that Atman. So this. Till we realize that Atman, this is very necessary for us main, to maintain the purity. But the Atman itself is a Sangha, untouched. And he's the Lord of the universe. The one self, non-dual, is the Lord, the controller of everything. Controller in the sense, not like an extra cosmic God or an autocrat, no. That's why there's an adjective behind that. Sarva Bhutantar Atma. One who is the self of all. He makes himself manifested in numerous form. One who realizes him. For him is the happiness, the joy. Once when Swamiji was in America, a certain Ingersoll, I think, he said, that we do not know what exists. This world is all what we know. So I want to enjoy the life to its fullest extent. So supposing I have an orange, I squeeze it and get every drop of it. Swamiji says, that's good. Even I have a fruit. You have an orange, I have a mango. And I also extract every bit of it, but in a different way. I know that I am deathless. And I know the whole of this is nothing but me. It's I who manifest through everybody. Just imagine. If it is a joy to enjoy the bliss of one body, it should be certainly infinite bliss to enjoy the infinite joy of infinite bodies. So you squeeze your fruit in this way and enjoy every bit of it. Swamiji had said, this is what it means. This Atman, when I realize my infinite nature and that I am interconnected with everyone, my joy becomes limitless. Only a person of this understanding enjoys supreme bliss. 13th one. So in the same strain, he says, Nityo Anitya Nityo Anityanam Chetanas Chetananam Eko Bahunam Yo Vidadhati Kaman Tamatmastham Yenu Pashyanti Dhira Desham Shanti Shashwati Na Itaresham. The eternal among the non eternals, the intelligence among all among the intelligent, who, though one, fulfills the desires of the many, those dhiras, this is wise men, who perceive him as existing within their own self, to them belongs the eternal peace and to none else. So the Lord, the one, the unchanging reality behind this changing world, he is a substratum of the whole phenomenal existence. 
The supreme self is the witness of all creation, preservation, and the dissolution. At the end of the year, creation, everything is absorbed back into the prakriti, the nature, undifferentiated nature. In our last uh, chart, I had this shown you the Brahman and Maya, and the first evolute is undifferentiated nature. So that is what, when the whole universe is destroyed or taken back, it is, it goes into the Prakriti. It is not completely annihilated, but it stays in the Prakriti. And then again, it comes out in the next creation. That's how it said, Lord created the universe as in the previous creation. This is the hymn in the Vedas. Sri Krishna says in the Gita, Maya Dhyakshena Prakriti Suyati Sacharachara. All the movable and unmovable entities of the world, the Prakriti brings forth. I am just the presiding power, just a witness. I am there. So just at the power that's behind the whole prakriti is projecting this entire variegated universe but that's behind that is called as eko pahunam this one behind the many because and he is the giver of fulfills all desires of the many that is karma faladatha he because it's he is the self of all. He is within me. He did everybody. So his account is correct. No, no, there is no mistake. My actions will come to me alone. The results of my actions will come to me alone because he is within me. So everything is clear. Accounts are very clear. No muddling up. So he satisfies the wants and desires of each individual in whom he resides and and to them who know nothing to blame i get what i have deserved so there's a sense of satisfaction and through this i work out my salvation so this is how the upanishad is teaching us about the one reality behind all And finally, we come to the last, the 15th. Natatra Surya Bhati. It's also said, a doubt arises in our mind. Is it possible to have such uninterrupted bliss? Is it possible? The sages say, yes. They emphatically say, it is like a fruit in our palm. When the realization comes, yes, this bliss is there. So the, this, we until unless we realize it, we rely on the aptavakyas, on the words of the seers. So the Upanishads are the revelation of the seers. They say, yes, this uninterrupted, unalloyed bliss is a matter of experience. All that needs is I have to get rid of my desire for the finite. When that goes, the infinite manifests itself. And is it palpable? Yes, it is. Like a fruit in the palm. And finally, it, the Upanishad literature paints the wonderful uh, scene on the canvas of this universe. It says the Atma alone is the true luminous entity, Swayam Prakasha. And its luminosity is the one which the whole manifested universe borrows. Natatra Suryo Bhati, Na Chandra Tarakam, Nema vidyuto bhanti kuto yam agnihi 
तमेव भांतम अनुभाति सर्वम तस्य भाषा सर्वमिदम विभाति देर इन द आत्मन द सन डज नॉट इल्यूमिन नॉर द मून एंड द स्टार्स नॉर डज दीज लाइटनिंग्स इल्यूमिन देर एंड मच लेस दिस डोमेस्टिक फायर वेन दैट शाइन्स एवरीथिंग शाइन्स आफ्टर दैट बाय इट्स लाइट ऑल दिस manifested universe is lighted this statement is so simple needs not much interpretation we say the sun is self luminous but we know the sun was born once and it will die sooner or later we know the solar system will go away so that means to say that which has a beginning has an end so that which has a beginning and end cannot be eternal that just the proof that the luminosity what the sun has is also borrowed and if that is borrowed what to speak of other things it naturally follows that everything is borrowed luminosity borrowed intelligence and the upanishad paints this in a wonderful painting of sublimity i would not distort this uh, verse by explaining i will just refer to a beautiful paragraph from swami vivekananda's complete works he says that upanishads are the literature is the, the upanishadic literature is the most wonderful painting of sublimity the world has not that this type of sublimity is not there in other cultures or nations it is there but always the grasp of the infinity is through muscles through the senses or the vastness of space even in the early vedic literature this has been found that they try to reach the infinite through the vastness of space or something like that but they soon found out that infinite cannot be reached in that way that even the infinite space and expansion and the infinite external nature could not express the ideas that were struggling to find expression in their minds so they fell up fell back upon other explanations the language became new in the upanishad it is almost negative so it's sometimes chaotic sometimes takes you beyond the senses pointing to you something which you cannot grasp which you cannot sense but at the same time you are certain you feel certain that it is there what passages in the world can compare with this natatra suryo bhati na chandra tarakam nema vidyuto bhanti kudoyam agni there the sun cannot illumine nor the moon nor the stars the flash of lightning cannot illumine the place what to speak of the mortal fire so that is the glory of the atman the self luminous self conscious eternal one supreme reality which manifests itself through every body that's the beauty if the atman is of all those things what is that to me but we are that we are that that is what the upanishad is is trying to tell us and the nature has given us all the instruments that are necessary to gain this knowledge and this is our chance here and now never if we delay so let's make use of the opportunity given to us and progress in our spiritual life and reach that supreme bliss namaste thank you Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. You're you're now invited to ask some um, questions, type of questions, bit of discussion. I'm right. I'll, I'll get it going. Uh, my ears pricked up, uh, Shudra Pranaji, when you. This, this is, I think, a controversial issue that the idea. that if you're going to have a setback in your spiritual evolution rather than merely being born into adverse circumstances to to suffer 
the pains of whatever you, you've done wrong. It can go further than that. You can, you can be uh, reborn as, a, as an animal or even some inert object. And, and I just wondered at that. I, I thought, considering looking at it from a karmic standpoint, the terrible situation some people are born into, you would imagine how, why do you need anything even, even worse than that? <laughs> <laughs> true, 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 indeed, indeed. So, uh, some, you know, this is the age of, uh, what do you call Instant age. So everything is instant. Immediately you get it. So your karma fall also is instant. No need of going further. But it is true that the thing what they're going through is terrible. So there is no need for us to have a manifestation. But this human being has got a lot of luggages behind, a lot of bags. This concept of karma and it's, it's, it's a big theory. Um, what actually happens is, so it's not just the one birth that I'm going to result the consequences. Many more births are there, I have built many mansions. So what all the actions are there, but that doesn't mean to say that all the actions will come and it will reap in one go, no. Because there is this intelligent Atman behind and it is everything is open to it. Nothing can obstruct its eyes. We say, no, God knows everything. God knows every, every action of mine. See, that's what we say in a language of dev, uh, bhakti. We say God knows everything. Means my, I might not know what my previous actions are, previous my lives are, but the Atman, the intelligent principle behind knows. So there are many baggages, many manifestations, baggages are there. It will take, collect things from each of this and bring out what is necessary for me for, for the next manifestation. It's not that I'm getting it from only one bag. No. All those things which can go safely within one manifestation in one particular. So it various things might have made same thing in a different way. I would have made it. So all those actions will come together and it will come as a different. It's not that this I this life's the whole lot is going there because I might have made something good and I might have something bad. So how am I going to deal with? So what happens? All the only the bad won't go. There is good also. So the first the good ones is taken, finish it, then goes. So there's a choice is made by the intelligent principle which is behind. If that principle was not there, everything would have been chaotic and meaningless. I guess I guess it's only that the your potential to work through some of those things in a human body is much greater than if you're confined to an animal or a plant even, or and some inanimate object, you, it, it's, that's where it seems a bit unfair. You, you no, think, it, it is. Right, but, but I've done something wrong in this life. I'm gonna have to pay for it next no. time. Give me another body so I can quickly. Yeah, so what happened? That. You see, that's the beauty. In, in only in the human body, you make new karmas. New karmas are not made in any other body no. because the, uh, memory, uh, intelligence is quite different. So the other bodies have the bhogatanu. You just work out. You work work out, but you don't bring new karmas. New karmas are brought only in this psychophysical organism called human being because of that cerebral system. This wonderful cerebral system which is given, its function is so great. It, a fraction of it is utilized by human beings. This is what the Upanishad is asking, tap into that, make best use of it. But other manifestations are you just finish it. You finish the effect of that karma. You don't make new karmas. To make a new karma, even gods cannot make. Can you imagine? They enjoy the, the, reap, the fruits of the good actions and the heavenly bodies. But only a human being, in this very Upanishad will tell you later on, in different bodies, how you perceive the reality. 
it's in the human body it is just like a mirror just like how you see the your reflection in the mirror so you reflect you your own self in the in in the pure intelligence so that is the greatness and the uniqueness of the human body that is why man, man is called as the crown of creation what else it says you know god created everything and then finally he created man and asked the angels to come and bow down to him and everyone did only one didn't obey and he became the satan so why what's what's behind this the human man is the greatest swami ji says no scripture can describe the greatness of man the capacity to grasp the infinite is only in the human body shri ramakrishna says look at the elephant such a huge animal but it cannot realize god only human being can do so that's the uniqueness so even if we give and that's the eternal damnation is not there like other religion you get back nature gives you another chance come on try even if the whole creation is destroyed once our sun dies everything is finished no everything is back into the prakriti everything is like shri ramakrishna gives a beautiful example of the granny having all the things in her pot and what she does when the creation is over she brings she brings back everything and puts that means you come with all the potentials of your previous life not just this life previous manifestations previous creations so it goes so eternal damnation is not there that is why creation of creation is going on still i and you are there that's the proof one more chance nature has given us so that's the beauty of vedanta always hope try again try again try again and it's only making us cautious of the difficulties and also teaching us you have got all the means you have got all the clue yeah anything else um mata you just um uh, i was just confused when you were explaining so the art uh, with regards to the hierarchy of uh, atman being the main boss and then the life force and then the five senses so what was the relation uh, there when you were explaining the story of uh, uh, who is the biggest in the five senses I'm not able to oh it was a bit hard to hear can you repeat the question so uh, is it better now can you make yourself clear the yeah the yeah and then hello yes, yes. yet can you can you repeat sorry yeah, can you repeat this question pratik uh yeah so i was asking is it is my voice clear now yeah now now i'm able to hear you oh sorry so i was uh, i was just confused when you were explaining about the atman and the senses and the life force so the atman is the main boss if i understand correctly and yeah. then what's the relation between the life force and the senses or uh, senses and the life force prana and indriyas are almost uh, very closer because the indriyas function through the prana and the prana um what do you call activates the indriyas they were cl- close related oh okay okay yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah. when we say indriyas don't confuse it with the instruments it is it's not the eye or the ear uh, these are only the points the nervous system which is within it's very fine it is that is called as indriyas <laughs> this is the instruments system. these are instruments and the indriyas are the nervous system fine nervous system centers nerve centers so it is that it the, uh, along with the prana this nerve centers the mind and the intellect this big bulk we call the so, subtle body it is that which goes so just to rephrase to what you're saying so the life force is the brain the nervous system and the breath that's what we're saying and the tools are the senses 
Ah, two. These are the outer senses. These, these are called as uh, instruments yeah, yeah, of sense yeah. organs. But the sense organ itself is the nerve centers, the nerve currents, okay. and that it functions. The prana functions through that. It's the nerve current. So the very in very closely related, almost sticking like. Yeah. So when a person dies, so mm -hmm. the first the atman goes away, and then the senses are still alive for a minute. So for example, a person dies, and then for a few minutes, the atman goes away, and then we say the life force is still there, or the life force is gone, but the sensor senses are still there. Uh, How what happened? You... Yeah. 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 Well, let, let let's uh, try to understand this phenomenon called death. Yep. Uh, you see, the uh, main thing is. The fuel for the uh, embodiment is the karma. Karma is like the oil in the lamp. So you, we have worked out everything. And as the, uh, the oil is becoming less and less, the flame becomes dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. So it's like that. So this whole lot, here I'm saying why Atman is not the, the pure Atman, because this Ignorance is there. So this Atman is identifying itself with all these things. That is why it is called as an embodied being. In the Gita, he says, Agnane Navritam Jnanam. The Jnana, knowledge, is covered by ignorance. Ignorance of what? It doesn't know that itself, it, that itself is pure and infinite. So it is identifying itself with all these things. So it is sticking. That is called as attachment. You know, and another, uh, there is a beautiful adjective for the Atman, Nirlepa. Nirlepa means which is not, nothing is sticking to it. It's clean, clear. So once I understand that I'm the pure Atman, the, all this, I just brush aside, I shake off. Then in this Upanishad, just like removing a grass, you remove, you, you just remove remove it. But another example Sri Ramakrishna gives is the coconut. You know, the coconut shell the co is there and the coconut is there. When the water is there, the coconut is very green. When you scoop it, what happens? You scoop some of the skin too. Isn't it? But if the coconut is dry completely, it just gets separated. That is the mukti, but here when for the embodiment, knowledge is not there. I do not have the knowledge of my true self. So I'm getting attached. This is what we say now, attachment, attachment. I at get attached to my psychophysical organism. So I will have to carry the baggage of it. So therein comes all this whole luggage. So the self is within and it is surrounded by all this, the life forces, the indriyas, the mind and the body, the whole, whole lot. It becomes too heavy. It, it, this is what goes out. But once freed from it, it's just like a space. Oof, it goes off. Yes. Did you want? Yep. Would I make Thank you so understand? Much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Time for more questions. Yeah, we, we welcome questions. Um, Maraji, you, mm. you were saying earlier that um, when the desire for the finite vanishes, the infinite becomes apparent. Is that right? Mm? You said earlier that when the desire for the finite vanishes, the infinite becomes apparent. Not only apparent, it, not apparent. The infinite becomes tangible. Tangible. Yeah. So part that is of why he said that it's like a fruit in the palm. No one can, anyone can, whatever people say, I know that I am infinite. It is just like a fruit in the palm. I am free. I am free. This sense of freedom comes to me. When my finitude, my, uh, my attachment to the finite things are given up. Only a person of that type can understand. So this is the struggle. Um, even... We, we, we know that this material universe 
has a beginning and science can take us to uh, a minute fraction of a second um, just after the singularity expands. And we know it's going to, well, we don't know quite where it's going to go because it's still expanding and we don't know the limits of it. But this, I think our sun is currently a third generation sun from the start, after the start of the universe. So it all comes to an end. And everything we see is finite. We're stuck everywhere we look, we see, we see finite. So we've now got to get around that and try and see what, what is, is infinite. And that's, for me, it's, it's hard to get my head around that. Yeah, you, you can study it only through your own uh, psychophysical organism. Yeah. Where shall we go for it? Because this is the nearest one. This is the nearest one. And that, that it starts, it doesn't come over a, overnight. We cannot understand the finitude also. Even the finitude of the, ness of the universe also, we, it doesn't enter into us. We might intellectually, it may go. Still, it doesn't enter, enter into our heart. That is why we yeah. again go behind them. Followed, intellectually understanding is one and feeling it through the heart is another one. So when I feel completely, I'm convinced that no, this will not give me anything. Then I retreat. I go, I turn myself back to it. So that has to come. It comes through slow, steady education. That is, that's why Vedanta is for constant, constant pondering over. It's only through that way the mind gives up its finitudeness. Yeah. Thank you. Still some time there, everybody. Uh, I might jump in again then if, because <laughs> I'm, I'm fascinated, I think, as many people are, um, with these type of verses that we've looked at today, these ancient rishis, it's showing you, showing us what, what ter incredibly deep experiences they've had. They're lit literally transcending the universe, so to say. Um, and it's it's a long way away from from what any, from what anyone has what most people experience in their daily lives. It's a big gulf there. But I, I'm particularly interested in the reports and the study going on into these near death experiences, and and how they are now discovering. One of the scientists who's studying this. There are reports that the people, their, their heart and brain have stopped functioning, and yet they are still conscious. They are finding this out from, from not all of them who have the new death experiences. It's, it's a small number of them. And, and then, of course, they had this profound feeling of peace. Some have reported that there's a guiding figure there with them, so they feel very comforted. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering, the research they're doing into that now is another way of maybe we, we, we're getting some evidence of what these rishis discovered mm -hmm. without ourselves having to go into a very deep meditative state. So I think I'm thinking this is something to watch closely, this research going into these near-death experiences. It seems to be a, a, a how should we say, a, a scientific um, verification of what the rishis have been teaching us see the that lady so singapore lady that lady i don't remember some starts with j her name i don't remember uh, she, wrote a book. she wrote a book on that that she says um the uh, the doctors were there she's um, in the coma or something like that and the doctors are saying the senses are shutting down and they're saying, and they're weeping, the dear ones are weeping, the doctor is telling, sorry, we can't do. She's hearing it, everything. So you see, there, this uh, mind is there, mind is there. So that means to say mind is not connected with the brain. Brain is something in it, this mind is working. It's, brain is physiological. Uh, and so, Mind can stay apart from that separately. 
this evidence Ranganathan and the Maharaj speaks in his uh, Upanishad, Brihadaranyak Upanishads. And then she says she could, she's not able to convey because her speech organ is not there. But the last one is to shut is the ear. You see, in our um, uh, devotional cult, in the uh, uh, devotional path, we take the name of God. We repeat the name of God. And if, as the life energy forces ebbing, it becomes hard for the per person to repeat the name of God. Then we chant the name of God in front of the person. Why? One of our um, sannyasini passed away. She said, look, early morning, four o'clock, all are in the meditation, individual meditation. She said, look, don't make a big noise. I think my last moment is coming. I lie down. I'll try to repeat as much. She's, she's talking all that. Just a few minutes are there for her passing away. I'll repeat as much as I can. Then when I don't, you start repeating. I will be able to hear what you're saying. She said that. I will be able. Just repeat. Don't panic. Don't keep running and calling everybody. Okay? Goodbye. God bless you. She lay down. It was like a drama. The sisters who were there, just two sisters were there with her. They told me, just like as if I'm going to sleep, you just cover a sheet on me. It was like that. She said, she was repeating with her. They were singing, chanting Sri Ramakrishna said. Then she said, do it loudly. I don't have energy. Then she closed her eyes. And for six, seven minutes, they chanted the name of God. We could see clear. She's gone. Completely, they found no breath, nothing, and poor sisters. They were almost they couldn't even do anything. And then they rang the secretary and the other matajis, and they came. Finish. The person has already gone. See how clearly she could go. This experience. Uh, she was a very scholar, studied, and uh, she had pondered over all this, so that this knowledge gave her strength. To meet that last and so beautifully. No fear, nothing. You see, however it is, when we are in the psychophysical organism, the loss of it has some, some sort of uh, effect on our mind. But see the, how the knowledge helped. I mean, she might not have been realized, that's true. But then all this intellectual conviction gave her the support. And with that, she took the name of Ramakrishna and went. So that's the beauty. So that's the last organic band. So that can be there. So the mind can be without the brain. So that shows, this is a proof. Ranganathan Maharaj says in that, Brihadaranyak Upanishad, he says, so if this becomes clear, then the, the existence of the, the presence of the infinite Atman becomes a matter of uh, proof. Yeah. Hmm. So I think. So thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. <laughs> Let me just adjust this. And as many of you know, this is a monthly series of talks on the Katara Upanishad. So we'll look forward to having that next, next month. Similarly, next Sunday, we have another monthly talk, and that will be on Raja Yoga. Uh, that will be given by Prabhajika Gayatri Pranaji. And that's from 11 a.m. Also, this coming Friday night, we have the fortnightly Bhagavad Gita discussion, where in, in chapter six, the yoga of meditation, very interesting chapter. And do hope all of you are coping up well with this never-ending lockdown. Surely things will start to open up soon. So please stay safe, keep well. Hope you're all getting through your vaccination process. And we'll, we'll, look, we'll look forward to having you join us for all our upcoming uh, Friday night discussions and Sunday talks. Bye for now.